Well, we're studying lessons from the book of Genesis. Genesis is the book, first book in the Bible. It's the book of origins or the book of beginnings. And in the book of Genesis, we find a lot of real short, brief, sparse stories that explain a lot of things in the beginning of a lot of things. And the one we're looking at now for a few weeks is the uh, story of Cain. Cain, in chapter 4 of Genesis, Cain, you'll recall, was the firstborn of humanity. Uh, Adam was created by God. He was taken from the ground and created. Eve was taken from Adam in her creation. But Cain was born, the very first baby born of the very first woman. A marvelous thing. God had promised that the offspring of the woman would do some significant things in terms of their salvation. So when little Cain was born, Eve expected that. But as we see, uh, things have not gone, gone exactly according to the plan. Um, last week in chapter 4, the first few verses, we saw that uh, Cain had a younger brother, Abel, and eventually these two brothers uh, brought sacrifices to the Lord. They came to worship the Lord. And Cain brought some of the fruit of his efforts that he had been getting from the ground as he tilled and toiled and brought forth from his own efforts an, an offering. But Abel brought to the Lord a more acceptable sacrifice, a more pleasing sacrifice. And we said that some of the reasons perhaps is, first of all, it was a blood sacrifice, which God had required from the very beginning. Abel's offering was a sacrifice of uh, thanksgiving. It was a sacrifice of the first fruits, the fatlings. It was the one that was the firstborn. It was the, pre the premier, the prime sacrifice, the very best. But most importantly, it was a sacrifice of faith. Abel believed God. He believed that God would honor that sacrifice as it, that sacrifice, as we noted, pointed to the coming full and final sacrifice of Jesus Christ in His death upon the cross. And the Lord accepted and had regard for Abel's offering. And then we don't hear much more about Abel because that sacrifice, when it's offered, is finished. It's complete. It's accomplished. It is efficacious. It's accomplished what it came to accomplish. But Cain still had a problem. And the Bible said there in the last verse we looked at in chapter 4 that Cain was very angry that his sacrifice had not been accepted by the Lord and his face fell. When we leave Cain, we leave him in this condition of spiritual depression. Uh, he is downcast. He is angry in his heart. Uh, he has a real serious uh, heart condition. His uh, situation is incomplete. His situation is, is in turmoil. It is a situation that is open for some uh, admonition and correction. Uh, Cain's spiritual life needs some work. And in that sense, we are like Cain. We are born in sin, and our sacrifice of ourself and our sacrifice of our works are not adequate. So we need some work. And this is what you see. This is one of the most precious passages anywhere in the Old Testament. Anywhere in the Bible, this is a little paragraph here in Genesis verses uh, 4, chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, a little paragraph that describes God, God Himself, dealing with Cain in Cain's spiritual condition. And so he is downcast. He is, uh, he is guilty. Uh, he won't look the Lord in the eye. He, he will not uh, respond. His heart is filled with anger. He has some serious issues, and the Lord is the Lord is going to help him. So let me read first the text, and then we'll point out a couple of lessons from this text. I'm reading from Genesis chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule 
over it. This is one of the most cogent and incredible paragraphs anywhere on God's relationship in dealing with a sinner. And let me just point out a couple of things I think that will be helpful. Number one, in this, in this encounter between God and Cain, God, of course, takes the initiative. God always takes the initiative in salvation. It's, it's, we love Him because He first loved us. And so God comes in love and mercy and compassion and patience and long-suffering to this sinful person, Cain. And He wants to work with him and help him and counsel him. So the first thing God does is said, uh, God asks Cain the question, why? He says, why are you angry? And why is your face fallen? Why are you downcast? Why are you in this spiritual depression and discouragement and in this, this uh, guilt and shame? Um, that's a good question. Often God starts his conversations with a question. Back with Adam, he said, where are you? And made Adam have to assess his situation. And that's what the question from God does. And this, this question is asked of us as well. Uh, why? It makes us search our heart. It makes us be introspective and to think about our spiritual condition. Um, one of our problems in our modern day society is we've not allowed time and space for serious, long-term contemplation of our spiritual condition. Because we have, with electronics and everything else that we have in our society, we don't have much time for uh, contemplation. There's not much silence. There's not much downtime. There's always something playing. There's always something running. There's always something to see. There's always something from the time we get up to the time we go to bed at night. There's busyness in our lives. And so we don't take time. It's interesting that the word muse, M-U-S-E, means to think and to, and to have some uh, introspection and some contemplation and some cogitation, uh, to use an old word. And, but we don't do that much. And instead of having musement, in our life, we have awe, amusement. Awe is the negation. We do not let ourselves muse. We do not let ourselves contemplate. We do not our, let ourselves sink into our thoughts and, and, and really work through what is going on in our hearts and in our mind and in our souls. And, and, and we do not do what even the philosopher said, know thyself. We don't know ourselves because we are amused completely. We're amused with music and with uh, videos and with uh, ball games and with all kinds of things. Everything, a chat, and, uh, is, is all amusement. So the more amusement moves in on our life, the less time we have to muse and to think. And that's what God's calling for here. He's telling Cain, why do you think you're in this condition? What, what is your problem? Can you analyze it? Can you come up with a solution? Cain, do you have an idea of why you are depressed and why you are fearful and why you are ashamed and why you have feelings of guilt and why you don't do the things that you ought to do and why do you not live the way you ought to live? So God's call upon Cain is to think it through. And that's God's call upon us too, is to, is to think it through, to come up with, with reasons to investigate our our assumptions to think about and investigate and uh, contemplate our motives and see what kind of thinking we have. Because as a man thinks in his heart or in his innermost being, so he is. And everything that about us comes from the inside. We don't work on our inside. We work on our outside. <laughs> uh, you know, I've I'm an old man. I've been going to the gym since I was 13 years old. I've been a member of a half a dozen of the best gyms in the Dallas area over the years, working out, you know, and running and doing the elliptical and all that. I'm worried about my outside. I want to have, I want to have good physical health. But what about the inside? What about the inner man? And really, the Bible is concerned a lot more about the inner man or the inner person, than, than the Bible is about the outer person. Bodily exercise profits something, a little. It's good. Nothing wrong with it. But 
It's the inner man that is renewed day by day. Actually, the outer man is perishing. And so God moves us inward in our spiritual quest. He wants us to go in and into our souls and think about it. So God asked the question, why? And then, I don't know what answer Cain gave, if any, but God counsels uh, Cain. And here's God with His long suffering. Uh, God is the God of a second chance. Uh, in His first opportunity to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth, Cain absolutely blew it. But the Lord didn't condemn him. He rescued him. He moved in to help him. And that's what God does. We may have blown our first chance. We may have not done the right thing. But God is long-suffering. His mercy endures forever. He's patient. He is uh, forbearing. It's a good word, forbear. It means to have a right to punish us, but He doesn't. He forbears. And He holds off and He gives us more of a chance. And that's what God does with Cain. Uh, we see the nature of God here so clearly. And as He deals with this poor, hurting, angry, distraught, frustrated, downcast human being. And sometimes we have to be in that emotional state before we uh, can even listen to the voice of God. But the voice says to, to Cain, it says, if you do well, if you do what's right, everything will be fine. Uh, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? All Cain had to do really was to repent, to listen to what God told Adam about the blood sacrifice and offer the same kind of sacrifice himself. Cain had every opportunity to be accepted before God if he would just move in that direction. If you do well, everything will be uh, well with you. And if that had been the only side of the proposition, and Cain would have responded properly in repentance and faith and thanksgiving and come to the Lord on the right terms, cast himself upon the mercy of God and receive the forgiveness of his sins, made the sacrifice that pointed to Christ, who was the one that made the actual atonement for sin that takes away sin, then he would have been fine. But no, apparently Cain did not. And so God gave him a warning. God saw his heart, and so he gave him the other side of the coin. He gave him an admonition and an, an opportunity to uh, do well, as the Scripture says, but he now gives him a warning. And the warning uh, is uh, what God gives uh, to Cain. It, the warning is about sin. Sin. Little word, but very significant. It is the condition of the heart. A sin is what determines uh, our behavior. The sin that's within us, we have to deal with it. He tells him, if, if, if you don't do well, then you've got a problem. And your problem is sin. And it says that this sin crouches at the door, ready to spring. It was kind of a vague uh, a reference to the serpent that had coiled and was striking. And uh, the promise of salvation was that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. And so you've got to deal with the serpent. It's the, it's, it's the offspring's lot in life because of Adam and Eve's original sin. It is the lot and the circumstance of humanity to have to deal with sin. And sin's waiting to strike. And, it, and the sin will strike with a venom that is a death blow. The wages of sin, the outcome of sin is death. The Lord says, in the day that you sin, you shall surely die. So God promises that there is a, an awful consequence to our sin. A sin will ruin you. But even in this life, sin will dominate you. It says the desire uh, of sin is, to, is against you. It says for you here, but it can be against you. It's an opposition. But you must rule over it. That is the whole quest in spiritual living, is somehow ruling over sin, getting a handle on sin, being able to deal with it, being able to to have its, its power and its penalty and, and its presence around us completely dealt with and handled. And that's what we have to do. Now, the gospel message is very simple, that we can try to deal with it ourselves, 
and not very successfully, or we can lay our sin upon another, upon a substitute, upon Jesus Christ, and His death will be the death that our sin deserves us. So, and, and before we get too much further, I've used this word sin, and let me just take a moment or two, and this is important use of our time uh, today, and to just sort of uh, survey the concept of sin as it's found in the Bible. In the Old Testament, there are several words. One of them means uh, to, to miss the mark. It's the word chata. Sometimes that's the way that Hebrew gets in your throat. Chata. And it means to miss the mark. And it's though there's a target and you're shooting and you just miss it. And the target, of course, is perfect obedience to the law and the Word of God. And we take a shot at it, we give it our best effort, and we miss it. Another word for sin is the word hahuan, and it means lost. It means to turn aside. We're, we're going down a path that's the right path, and then we just stray. All we, like sheep, we just go astray. We go our own way. There's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is destruction. And so that's a word for sin. It's just sort of drifting off on our own. Uh, so far, we haven't heard of anything that's horribly violent and nasty, like murder and violence and, and uh, fraud and rape and robbery and all the rest. That's all included, but sin essentially is just kind of going your own way, doing your own thing, and, uh, and just kind of without regard to what God's law is. Another word that's used is the word ma'al, and it, it has to be unfaithfulness. It's the idea of unfaithfulness. We, we're, we're not faithful to God God is a, a, a contract and a covenant partner with us, and we, uh, we don't give Him His due. We don't uh, live in the right relationship. It's also a word that's translated meaning to default. Uh, we know what a default is. A default is you don't do anything. If you don't do anything about your sin, you're in your sin because you were born in sin. And so we, if we don't do anything about it, if we just default then it goes just like a default in any kind of program. It goes automatically to one particular course of action. Well, if we default and we don't do anything, we end up in sin, living in sin, dominated by sin, dying in sin, and being punished according to uh, uh, default. Another word that's used is the word pasha. Now, that's a pretty serious word. It means an, a rebellion or a revolt. Uh, it means to reject God's authority. And God's authority uh, is transcribed not only in what all God has said in the Scriptures, but in, in a moral code, which we got from uh, the hand of Moses, the law, the Ten Commandments, other commandments in, in, uh, that the Lord has given, and there's many, many of them. But to just say that, that doesn't apply to me, to set the moral code of the Lord aside is, is a revolt, is to get out from under His authority. That's why we are, in a sense, we are rebels. We are trying to overthrow God's authority. And, that, and a lot of people try to do that. The, the, most, the easiest way to try to overthrow God's authority is to make up some notion in your head and try to work it out logically and live with it. And that is that there is no God. So if there's no God, there's no authority. There's no law. There's no judgment. There's no expectation. Uh, if there's no God to sin against, then there's no sin, and we're fine. So if we can just get rid of God, the problem is that there's a piece of evidence that there is a God, and that piece of evidence is the entire universe with all the stars and the planets and the immensity and the microscopic cell and all the intricate design and everything. How do you explain all that without some kind of divine power and intelligence at work. It may not be a God you think about when you think about the stories about God in the Bible, but there is some huge, incredible, almighty creator and the, the, the cause, first cause of all things. And it's easy to say, well, that, uh, that didn't count. Uh, that, the earth came about some way other than a creation. And so just dismiss God all the way. That's a, that's a very serious sin. In fact, that sin can get you into all kinds of trouble because you set aside God, then you don't listen to anything the Lord says. You don't even listen to His voice. Even when He pleads to your conscience and says, you know, hear me, obey me, listen to me, let me help you. 
even when God's talking to you, you've already ruled him out, so you come up with some psychological explanation for these feelings, these notions in your soul about, uh, about needing something and being incomplete and being unclean and need to be cleansed and need to be forgiven, and you just dismiss your conscience completely. And God works and calls us through the conscience. But if you've just dismissed God, God doesn't, there's no such thing as God, God doesn't exist, then you have vacated, you have defaulted completely. Now let me quickly go through a few of the words that's in the New Testament. Those are Old Testament ideas of sin. In the New Testament, there's just, there's about, I've, I've listed out here the Greek words and I've got about uh, eight or ten of them. But let me just give you one. One is the word uh, for ignorance. You just simply don't know. That's a sin. For him to know to to know to do right. So there's a there's a notion of right and wrong, and then but to not know that something is wrong is a sin within itself. And then there's the uh, the notion of a violation. There's a word that means uh, a violation of law. Actually, it's the word anomia, which means no law. It means lawlessness. And the sin is lawlessness. That's a direct quote from one of the New Testament verses. Sin is lawlessness. You just you set law completely aside. Almost all of these have something to do. Then there's a word that corresponds to the word that we saw a moment ago, to miss the mark. It's the word hamartia. It's the word that is the kind of the chief word for sin uh, in the New Testament. Then there is a notion of being uh, uh, passing over a line or being out of bounds. It's the uh, parabasis is that word. It, it means to be out of bounds. And my goodness, do we, do we worry about something being out of bounds? You ever watched an NFL football game where they run 75 replays of whether or not one little blade of grass was either in the chalk or not in the chalk? Was his foot down? Was the knee down? Where, and, and, you know, that we enforce that beyond all measure. You know, was he inbounds? Was he out of bounds? Did he break the plane? You know, was one foot down, two foot down? You know, and, and they just run it ad nauseum till they supposedly get it right, especially if it's a scoring play or if it's a playoff game. Or, and especially, it's important to be in bounds. In tennis, you ever watch a tennis match where you, you know, well, you get the point. And, that, and to be out of bounds is, a, is one of the, the notions of sin. Another notion of sin uh, in the uh, uh, New Testament is to the idea of to it's parake. It's, it's the word that means to disobey a voice. You hear a voice or a command or a question and you disobey it. You ignore it. Another word for uh, is uh, paraanomia and it means to um, uh, put aside, to set aside, to, to just disregard. And then another word for sin, another concept of sin is the idea of falling down or failing. And then uh, another one is uh, the idea of to uh, discard. In other words, you've got something, but then you just throw it away. And so you see these, these ideas are all related to one another, telling us some things about uh, sin. So, so it's not like it's an amorphous, ill-defined, vague notion in Scripture. Uh, if you study it through, and I just gave you a quick survey, if you do a pretty good study of those words and concepts in their context, the way they're used, in the scriptures, God has not left us guessing. It is pretty well defined. There's a sense in which the scriptures are very forensic, very legal, and they they out they line a lot of things out so that there's no question about what we are actually talking about when we're talking about sin. And if we if that wasn't enough, uh, the Bible has, and especially in the New Testament. Uh, full-blown sin list. Not only do we have the Ten Commandments, which we can, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not bear false witness, and um, so forth. But we also have uh, states of mind, behaviors, um, attitudes, and all of that that are, that are really spelled out. Biblical psychology is a very well-developed science. Uh, understanding the heart and the soul of a person from a from a biblical standpoint, and uh, there are several sin lists in the New Testament, and I'll just give you a, a two or three. Uh, Romans chapter one. If you get to the very end of the chapter, there, uh, and go ahead and read the whole chapter. But when you get to the end of the chapter, Paul will delineate about twenty or twenty-one things that are sin uh, in the book of. Uh, 
1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul writing to the church at Corinth, a pretty sinful church, he outlines another there in chapter 6 as a long list of particular sins. Then there's one in the pastoral epistles, which Paul wrote late in life to a young pastor, Timothy, in chapter 1. There's a, a shorter list, but a real cogent list of things that are sins. One of the uh, the fullest sin lists that spell out what sin is uh, is found in the uh, uh, book of Galatians chapter 5. And in there they're called the works of the flesh. And it says that they are manifest. The works of the flesh, in other words, that they're made known. They're, they're, when something is manifestly true, it's anybody can see it. That's what the word manifest means. Well, that's the way sin is. It's not, it's not uh, such a vague notion that you can't get a handle on it. Sin is manifest. And Paul spells out, I think, uh, about 15 or 16 uh, things here that make for sin. And I, I'll list most of them for you. And they're kind of grouped around uh, uh, sins that are social, that is, are violations or offenses like strife and emulation and contention and violence. They're, they're, they're social sins that we commit against our fellow man and our relationships with them. Uh, there are sexual sins, uncleanness, things like adultery, fornication, um, homosexuality, and um, uh, other things, the uncleanness that are, that are grouped together as violations of God's uh, uh, order. And then there are secret sins, sins that are in the heart like envy and lust and covetousness and all of these things that, that really don't manifest themselves outwardly, but inwardly they are and they serve as motivators. In other words, anger in the heart will eventually lead to murder. Hatred in the heart will eventually lead to murder. In fact, in our story, as you know the story pretty well, we get along here uh, next time we're going to find that that uh, this happened to Cain because Cain did not deal with his sin. He did not confess his sin. He did not repent. He did not come to God for forgiveness. He did not uh, lean upon the appropriate sacrifice. And so we'll see the consequences of sin. But let me just here, just before we run out of time, list uh, some of these. Um, adultery. This is out of Galatians 5. These are called the works of the flesh. That is works that we do in our human body, in our flesh, in our humanity. And uh, so humans, as humans, as sinful humans, me, you, all of us, will commit uh, quite a few of these sins. Not every single one of them all the time. We, we're not as bad as we can be. We still have the image of God in us. There's still a lot of goodness. There's a lot of wholesomeness. There's a lot of righteousness that's a remnant of God's good creation. But we're, we have this... Uh, this disease within our soul and the sin sickness. And, and here's some of the symptoms. Adultery. And by the way, adultery covers all kinds of sexual sin. The word adultery is an English word, an old English word, and it comes from, from two old English words. Ad, which is to or toward, and alt. Alt means the other, the alternative, the alternate. And so to go to or toward the alt the alternative is adultery. So for a man to go to a woman that's not his wife, for a man to go to a man for sexual pleasure or someone or a person to go to a near relative and or any number of other of these things, it's to go to the alternative. The alternative is the alternative to the way God set it up. One man, one woman together sexually and that's God's way. Anything else is to move to something else, to the alt, to the alternative. So that's what commit adultery means. It means to go to another. Uh, so, uh, and then fornication, which is the word pornea, pornography and filthiness and things that uh, stir the soul there. Um, there is uh, another word which is called lasciviousness, which is that which is uh, uh, extremely uh, uh, outrageous, uh, over the top, uh, vile. Um, another uh, word that's in this list is the word idolatry, to worship idols. And that's quite a complex thing and related to it is witchcraft, any kind of the occult to deal in, uh, in fortune telling and Ouija boards and, 
and uh, tarot cards and all sorts of things like that. And it goes way beyond that uh, as well. Another word is hatred. Hate is a vile and a vicious manifestation of sin in our lives. Um, variance, that's an interesting word. It, it, it talks about uh, us moving to, uh, uh, to discard or to, or to steal something. Emulations, anger, I think we know what that is. And that's, of course, the sin that was highlighted in the heart of Cain. He was angry. And, uh, and anger is one of those manifestations of sin. Uh, there's a word that means strife and violence. And, of course, that moved uh, into Cain's life as well. And if you want to really understand the nastiness and the pure awfulness of violence, we'll need to take a look at uh, next time when we come and we look at when Cain kills his brother Abel and see the nature of that violence, what was involved in the taking of his brother's life. And uh, we see violence around us all the time, mass shootings, all kinds of beatings and... and uh, beheadings. Violence is the most awful thing and it's been in the human race since the very beginning. And it's, it's one of the horrible manifestations of sin. Uh, there are seditions which are divisions or betrayals. It's for to, uh, to violate contracts and, uh, and covenant relationships. Uh, there's, there's a few more. Let me go. We're about out of time, but let me just mention uh, Heresy, which is wrong teaching. It's not only religious heresy, but there's also scientific heresy. There is social heresy. There are, there are lies. There are myths. There are, there are wrong notions that you can put in your brain that will absolutely cause you to, to have deleterious effects and to be awful to the human race. The, in these, uh, the, there are false teachings in areas way beyond religion. There are false teachings in economics, in sociology, and, and you have to know that this is, this is sin affecting those fields and those uh, areas of thought and human action. Envy, uh, murder, drunkenness. Drunkenness involves any use of chemical introduction into the body. So under drunkenness, not only is there uh, liquors and, and wine and beer and all of that, but there's also uh, drugs and any other kind of uh, of uh, pharmaceuticals by the word pharma, where we get our word pharmaceutical. Pharma in the Greek means sorcery, or it means witchcraft. You know, that's, I'm not going to go any more of that, but that's that's something to to think about. And then there's a couple of more. There's one more word that's interesting for our generation. It's called uh, revelings, and it's talking about riotous living. It's talking about to being over the top. Uh, heavy partying, all kinds of wickedness that goes on and, and behavior, regrettable behavior that goes on. A good word to put it would be the word orgy. Well, that that's just gives you an idea of what, uh, what we're dealing with when we, the Bible says that we've got to, to deal with sin. And uh, let me just sum it up by saying uh, there's a lot to say on the subject of how you master sin, but um, there was a promise given when Jesus was born. And the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus, whosoever, the name of Jesus is significant. The name Jesus means Savior. And they, so the angel said to his parents, you shall call his name Jesus, Savior. For, here's the reason, he, and he alone, by the way, he, Jesus, shall didn't say he might or he hopes to or he's going to try to or he's going to make available a way of salvation. It says he shall. That's, that's the, that's the uh, uh, word of determination. He shall save. He shall save. His people. God has a people marked out for salvation and, and he'll save his people. And I'll tell you who who these people are, that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord, whoever trusts in this name of Jesus, thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And he will save us from our sins by atoning for it, by paying the price. He will forgive us our sins on behalf of God. He has the power as God to forgive sins. 
and he will remove that sin from us so that it makes no more demands upon our lives and we are free to begin to please him. And then one day the promise of eternal rest and eternal peace and eternal life is a condition that is free from sin. We're back like Adam and Eve were in the garden before sin ever entered the human race. So you and I, like Cain, have to deal with something, sin. It's real. How do you deal with it? What do you do with it? How are you going to eliminate it? How are you going to conquer it? How are you going to dominate it? You're going to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved? Are you going to keep on just trying to clean up your life and reform and do better and, and, and make some New Year's resolutions and, and do all of that and then just continue to set aside God's law and avoid it and all the things that we've talked about? How are you going to deal with your sin? That's the, that's the question of the whole Bible. What are, what are you going to do? Seriously. What are you going to do about your sin? Your face is cast down. You're angry. You may be angry right now in your heart frustrated, fearful, ashamed. What are you going to do about that?